Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, MIA Radio. Um, I'm Karin Jervert, and the MIA audience might actually know me more as the arts editor at Madden, at Madden America. But I've actually also been working on this suicide hotline transparency project for about a year and um, today I am extremely excited to be interviewing Yana Kalu and Jamil Roberts from the Trans Lifeline. Um, and they'll be introducing themselves a little bit more in one second. And, um, but first I just wanna say that this interview is part of a series of conversations. It's the second one. Um, the first one being with Vanessa Green from the Black Line, um, called the Black Line which is up on MIA uh, website. Um, but these interviews are going to be conducted over the next few months around this issue of call tracing and non-consensual intervention of suicide hotlines. Um, so the project has a few different parts and ways that you can participate. So you can check that out on Mad America's website. And so we'll just get right into it. Um, all right, so how about you to introduce yourself? So yeah, my name is Jamel Roberts. Um, I don't use any pronouns, and I'm a Black queer person, um, and I am existing just on the gender spectrum. Um, I'm currently serving as the interim hotline manager at Trans Lifeline, and my work is to build practices of connection. Um, my goal is to shift the ways that we approach peer support by censoring the relationships that we build through the service that we provide. Um, I think that through this lens, we're able to focus on how people relate to one another and gathering to work and sharing purpose and by like encouraging analysis and curiosity while building trust. Um, we encourage one another to create language and to name and address the impacts of systemic harm and to nurture like individual and collective growth uh, and healing. Yeah, so important. So important. Thank you for that. And thank you so much for being here with us today. And Yana, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, Karen, thank you so much for having us and for this important work. My name is Yana Kalu, and I use they, them pronouns. And I'm an organizer and storyteller, and I'm currently launching a campaign to get cops out of crisis calls as the director of advocacy at Trans Lifeline. And I identify as a non-binary Brazilian-American person. And my work right now is really focused on centering lived experiences and survivors in abolitionist organizing, healing, and peer support. And in terms of my background, I just want to say that I'm really grateful for the mentorship and, and learning that I've received and in queer studies and labor and economic and racial justice movements and media justice movements and bring those perspectives to my work. And outside of work, another piece of work that I do is I, I co-facilitate a psychedelic peer support integration circle for trans and non-binary people as well. I am just uh, so excited to have you too because um, this work is is just this work and and it's just so important i feel let's uh start with the first question um that we have here for you guys and and just you know basically telling us a little bit about um how you arrived at the work you're doing in the community um and how you came to be leaders in this kind of peer support yeah i think that for me um this work is very personal um so a lot of it especially I know, I want to say at the beginning, but even kind of like throughout my journey, um, it was really a process of like shifting my relationship um, to what I defined as work. Um, I think that sometimes experiencing the world as like a black and like queer, you know, visibly queer person, um, I think that sometimes it can feel sometimes like a punishment. And I think that in some ways, the work that I was accessing um, felt aligned um, with some of, like, the, like, access that I felt like I was experiencing or, like, access blocks that I felt like I was experiencing. Um, and a lot of, like, what 
um, shifting my relationship to work was like was kind of like querying my definition of like what was like valid work to me, um, like what was labor. Um, and I began to like look into like what is like care work, what is the labor of a lot of the work that you know is still happening, um, and that doesn't necessarily get honored in like the necessity of it. Um, and inside of that, I think you know I was able to access my own kind of like I would say gift um, to really be able to support people through like really holding a conversation with them, um, and and. I think through that that moment um, for myself, I found Trans Lifeline, and it was a super aligned kind of moment for me. Truly, um, I applied to this to to this organization on my birthday, actually, um, and yeah, I applied as an operator, and really like navigated through through a lot of just like the space within the organization. Um, really through kind of like oh honoring like like the gifts that I can bring into the work um and like really being able to offer kind of like the care that I have for the way that that we treat the work that we do um and the impact that it has on the people that we touch with the work that we do um and so like that's just been a process of constantly honoring that and you know now I found myself here <laughs> I'm talking to you about it. <laughs> it's wonderful. So you started out as as the uh, as a as a hotline um, operator for the trans line. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, that was back I think in like 2020. And yeah, that was a time very mid pandemic, and I saw the need and I responded to to kind of like this thing. I also like met it with my own need for um something that was I think more fulfilling. I think that was also a thing um, that I wanted to kind of like have have work that felt good to me um, with people that I cared about doing something that I cared about. Yeah, I think that was something that I, I really personally needed um, because I was really losing, I think, my my grasp on like what it meant to work without the like care aspect of it. Um, it was becoming really really intangible and I have a hard time holding things that that don't make sense to me anymore <laughs> and you know mid-pandemic I really needed to work um in some sort of way that wasn't going to like you know I think like create a harder time um for myself and I think you know to really like kind of like face some of the hard times that we were having really like a lot a lot of space to really nav- navigate through them like through this work with people and it- Yana, um, uh, how about you? How did you come into the the community, uh, uh, being a community leader in this in this uh, area and the peer support? Yeah, thanks, um, Jamil. It was so nice to hear about your story that coming in that I hadn't heard before. And for me, I joined Trans Lifeline as the communications director after. I ended up having a pretty accidental career of being a communications director for about 10 years. And I I came to that work in like gender and queer justice movements at a time where uh, the early 2000s where the country was passing a lot of anti-gay and not even including trans folks marriage amendments and had just come through being a student in gender studies and really learning about how the structures of marriage were really harmful to queer folks, trans folks, folks of color, women, and then kind of put out into this movement where it was actually just focused on that and having some real conflict about what I was actually fighting for, for my people. And in that, was really fortunate to have a lot of mentorship around teaching organizers and activists, learning myself and then teaching other folks about how to share their stories. And for me, it's like, having trans stories told by trans people was a really important part of that 
communications work, but a lot of my work in those early days was really like about sanitizing movement language and saying, oh, we're saying like marriage for loving and committed couples, not gay marriage, because that grosses people out, right? It was really about being really respectable in terms of the ways we talked about this. So I had some of my first work in this area was really not aligned with the ways that I think about what we want and our whole lives. And so coming to Trans Lifeline, you know, 20 years later was really important to me to be in an organization that is really critical of the structures and systems that do exist for support, for structural and economic support uh, for, for our community. And I think in my personal life, having gone through a lot of the crises and challenges that a lot of our callers go through, knowing the importance of support outside of these systems that really harm people is really important and what brought me to you know, my work that's specifically abolitionist in terms of police and prisons and and also forced psychiatric treatment. And I will say that um, having the experience of using 911 and police when my father was unwell and having him Um, being, you know, personally responsible for him having been involuntarily held and and committed in a psychiatric hospital really let me understand the ways that the systems that we do have for help and support in those times are hurting people. They're not helping people and being really angry that that's all we had. That wasn't helpful. Um, And so I think that's what I, what makes the work that I'm currently doing feel really important and touches on, on my life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you had mentioned before about your, um, Trans Lifelines, uh, Cops Out of Crisis, um, uh, project that, that you're heading this, this advocacy project. And I wonder, you know, does now feel like a good time for you to talk a little bit about this kind of uh, experience that a lot of people have of this calling these um, hotlines and this, uh, the, the interventions that happen and, and this uh, non-consensual psychiatry that often ends up being the case for so many. Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, thank you. So, The Cops Out of Crisis Calls campaign really came from the years of providing community-based crisis support, as Jamil does, without police and creating a national peer support and crisis hotline model for providing care that is free of police intervention and involuntary hospitalization. So when we say we don't use 911 or police on our line, It's not just because we understand the way that police violence and criminalization and all of those things really hurt people. They do. That's really true. But we're also not saying that we think that a medical model is necessarily what folks need either, that involuntary hospitalization is the answer to no cops, right? It's actually being really critical of both of those systems and showing the need for this, the need for this campaign arose from really needing to have more dialogue amongst our peers, other hotlines about the harm that is caused to people in crises, particularly those who are trans, those who are under 18, those who are neurotypical or living with disabilities, those who are black and indigenous and folks of color. Um, The particular harm that we face in in having police intervention and forced hospitalization. We also know that that those kinds of those kinds of interventions don't get to the cause of these crises and they actually often exacerbate them. And so we are launching this at a time where crisis hotlines are touted as alternatives to calling police as more public awareness because of the work of black organizers as making people aware of the harm that that police cause to communities. 
um, that that crisis op- crisis lines are often shown as alternatives to calling police. But what many people don't know is that most national hotlines and tech services use geolocating surveillance to to engage local police, often without callers' knowledge and consent that police or emergency medical teams are gonna be arriving at their school or at their jobs or at their homes. And so um, this is really resulting in like hundreds of thousands of police interactions with people in crises each year and involuntary hospitalizations that unfortunately those the particularly involuntary hospitalization, emergency room visits, psych holds, we've seen that our suicide rates in this country actually keep growing as we increase these kinds of interventions. And that most people don't don't know that suicide attempts actually increase after having those forced, forced treatment. And so the things that we're actually, the systems that we actually have in place to support people are not are not helping people, and so one of the one of the things that our campaign is trying to do, aside from really educating other crisis services and services and hotlines about the necessity of community based alternatives to police and hospitals, and advocating for real upfront transparency on hotlines so callers know what to expect, is that we really want to reduce some of the harm of that and share some of the alternatives. We are one of several kinds of alternatives of systems of providing peer support and crisis care to people that doesn't actually engage those systems. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing how um, people just don't uh, seem to understand the scope of this sometimes and um, the, the kind of harm that's being done. Um, and Jamil, I wondered if you had um, any additional thoughts about the, the, the Cops Out of Crisis uh, program and, and anything to add? Um, I don't think I necessarily have anything to add. I think it's super, like we were talking about, timely and like alignment I think it's really perfect timing um especially to really kind of like focus on like the consent aspect of like what does it mean to support someone um yeah I think to really kind of like draw some attention to like how non-consensual interactions with these systems can be um, can really maybe like give us a lot more information to like move with so that maybe we like as a collective can really start to choose options for ourselves that really like honor our own agency. So I, I think through um, uh, the both of we, we learned a little bit about uh, what the Trans Lifeline offers as far as, um, you know, what the, the surfaces of the Trans Lifeline are. Yeah, thanks, Karen. We are best known for our peer support hotline that is created by, run by, and for trans people without the non-consensual police intervention that we spoke about. And we also offer many other programs here. I think one thing that is really unique about our Lifeline is that you're you're always, when you call Trans Lifeline, you will always be speaking with another person who identifies as trans and non-binary. And for many people calling us, this can be the first other trans person they've ever spoken with. So that peer aspect of really being able to connect with someone whose trans life is possible can be really, really helpful and prevent crises from happening in the first place. And we offer our our hotline in English, also in Spanish for monolingual Spanish speakers. And we also offer a family and friends service for folks who are supporting a trans person in crisis as well. And the other big pillar of our work uh, comes from our microgrants department, which recognizes that often, sometimes some of the best crisis support you can receive is economic support, that this program is based in mutual aid and provides, puts money directly in the hands of trans people for several needs for folks who need to change their name and gender marker legally on their identifying documents. And we also provide commissary 
grants and post-release microgrants for trans people who have been incarcerated or detained. And so that is some of the that's some of the economic redistribution work that we do in the microgrants program. And then certainly the 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 cops out of crisis campaign and our advocacy department is our first foray out of just providing those services and and into the advocacy space that really extends beyond just trans folks, right? We we believe that we believe that self-determination and agency that Jamil was talking about is important for, for all people in crisis. So Jamil, um how, how about um, your personal philosophy around um, caring for community members um, who are experiencing crisis? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. Yeah, I think I really center it around uh, empathy um, as a practice. I want to contextualize that by naming this, this uh, that at some point um, I read a book about empathy that went through like an etymolo- etymological history of that word and it pretty much uh, kind of like I don't know the middle kind of section really focused on like how empathy was used in um, psychology and psychotherapy and uh, there was um, at first some really crude tests um, that really kind of like were used for diagnosis based on the like a scale of empathy which at first was kind of like um pretty much a measure of like how much can like a uh, like a practitioner um empathize with uh like a client um and like the more that you could empathize with this person or like in this particular context empathize meaning like understand what they were going through um it was kind of like the more that like a practitioner could empathize with the client then the more sane that they were but then that's also where a lot of like kind of like implications right come into play like socially right where a lot of these practitioners were like cis hetero white men right especially during the time like this is like post world war one before world war two right during the time when there's a lot of like morality that gets kind of conflated into a different identity markers and so it's really it's it's really it's like when i say crude it's super an understatement but there's a part that kind of like goes beyond that and um in, in inside of this book that goes beyond that and it and it describes kind of like like the shifting right there's like a woman researcher that's like hmm, maybe we could look at this differently and um she works with children specifically um who kind of like are known to be unruly or have unruly behavior and like her method is to empathize with them by kind of like really giving them the space to experience like their experience um, and to like, or really like be the leader of like gathering this information for themselves. Um, and to see like, what does it mean to like access someone's agency and then to empower them to really start to name their reality and navigate through it in a more confident way, in a more agent way. Um, and that's really, I think what we try to access in the work that we do is to really like allow people who are in crisis or who are appear rather to be in crisis you know, the opportunity to to really, like, access their own agency um, and, and really decide what, where to go next for themselves in a way that, like, they think would be best so that they can, like, really continue on in a way that feels supported. I, I think so little of psychiatry uh, as it is today, as the three of us know here, <laughs> is is organized around any anything even close to, to this kind of care and empathy and empowerment. Um, it's it's the opposite in so many ways, right? Um, so um, people like you doing the work that you both do is so, so important. So the next question I have for you both is um, really what are the challenges of your work? Um, what are you running into um, out, out there around um, uh, what's stopping you from doing this really important work? Yeah, I think that's a really a really lovely question. Um, I think the challenges that that can really be named inside of the work, um, in in really like larger picture ways, I think that is just like the general kind of like undervaluing of of care work and like 
like what it means to do care work and like what the cost kind of really is, like what the labor of care work is. Um, and I think that like also some of like what can make it difficult is kind of like experiencing some of that kind of like devaluing um, and still providing this, this, this service, this offering to community. Um, and that kind of like, you know, really like contributing to how we experience our own capacities as people who do this work. Um, and like also experiencing like our own lives while doing this work, like how I named like, you know, I got hired through the pen, like within the pandemic, but like also we've been doing work throughout the pandemic completely. Um, I think, yeah, there's not been a moment um, that we really um, taken a, a really like set amount of time just away from it at all. And so it's kind of like like being inside of like ongoing and continuous work, and in some ways, kind of like really constantly gathering the capacity to to continue to do the work um, can really be uh, a balancing act. <laughs> um, and then I think that th there can be kind of like some perspective shifts that I think happen um, inside of like supporting people um, where, you know, I think it's important to to hold boundaries and sometimes to like also humanize the self as not just like like a fixture of peer support, but also like a, like a person um, who's like holding this experience in order to support someone else who's holding this experience. Um, and kind of like, what does it mean to not just be like this like vessel of support, but to like oh embody like connecting with someone in a supportive way? Um, if that makes sense. So that it's not so much an exchange, but it is like a collective and collaborative effort. And I think that those are the things that are that are really sometimes hard to grasp inside of like a lot of the ways that we that we as a collective, um, like as a society kind of like think about or approach, um, even like asking for support or like offering support at other times. So, Yana, um how can listeners support your work, um, specifically the Trans Lifeline, but also the Cops Out of Crisis work, um, and and uh, be in solidarity with with organizers like you? Yeah. So first, you can donate to our work. I think when we talk about defunding police as crisis responders, we are talking about funding alternatives like. A hotline in Jamil's work. So donating to Trans Lifeline is a way that you can support people being able to access this kind of care. You can join our campaign email list, which I will share with you. So when you share the podcast, you can have that link. And if you identify as trans or non-binary, you can apply to vol volunteer as an operator with our line and provide that care and learn learn how to do community-based care without, without police or involuntary hospitalization. Jamil, any, any uh, additions to that? How we can, how people, listeners can help out? Um, yes, definitely. You know, if you are a person who can support providing like peer support to, to people within community, um, definitely sign up to be a volunteer um, when those applications open. Um, that would definitely be super lovely just to have folks really showing up inside of their gifts. We've been talking about this it, this entire time, really, and um, the idea of the impact of um, oppression and bigotry and bias and stigma, you know, on people in suicidal distress um, and how, you know, it can be just ignored or denied by, by the, the frameworks and paradigm of psychiatry that, that is, you know, um, powerful now. Um, and uh, you know how you how lines like yours and and uh, these uh, initiatives that you uh, the Trans Lifeline is working so hard towards is is really interrupting this cycle um, of abusive care to towards trans people towards um, Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, um, all sorts of people um, are experiencing that that abusive care and um, uh, your your line sort of acts as this ceasing that cycle from from being activated 
um, which can save lives and I think does save lives really. So I think one, it's just important to name the history of psychiatry and psychology and pathologizing queer and trans people, black people, women, poor people, and the role of kind of individual responsibility that those kinds of systems create and the dialogue that's happening now around like just needing to break down like the stigma of mental health and that really hides the root causes of crises that are crises caused by colonization and racism, capitalism, like these are actually the crises that we're dealing with. And that just having more same day, next day, outpatient slots and having more beds open isn't going to support somebody who doesn't have a safe home to sleep in or a school where they can even go to the bathroom in. So I just want to name kind of the underlying piece that we hadn't directly gotten to. And I would also just really like to share the ways maybe that some of like the, the um, you know, behavioral health kinds of models of care frameworks are set up to really, you know, maintain maintain who is considered in the norm and, and causing harm for, for those forced to the margins. And I think that part of this is really explaining what, what are the like trans-specific, or we, we can speak to the, the trans-specific at least impacts of these kinds of things. So, so like sometimes when these interventions happen in forced ways, it can out it can out trans youth to unsupportive parents. Um, trans folks are less likely to have health insurance because of the ways that we are discriminated against in employment and our unemployment rates are so high because of this. So having huge ambulance and hospital bills when we know that like financial instability is a top suicide indicator, it's really harmful to our community. Um, we know that for trans people that involuntary psychiatric holds have been used to deny informed consent for life-saving trans care, like hormone replacement therapy or gender-confirming surgeries. We know that trans folks are misdiagnosed and mismedicated when the issue is um, gender dysphoria and the, and the oppression that comes along with being trans and that we can be you know, forced, forced medicated while actually denied trans-specific medications at the same time. We're put in the wrong gender units in psych facilities, in jails, in prisons. We're more likely to be sexually and physically assaulted in those places. And, and we're also not allowed access to trans health care while incarcerated as well, not just in hospitals. So um, we can, it can send undocumented trans people to detention centers indefinitely when, when ostensibly they're coming to the U.S. for asylum due to threats on their lives because they're trans and then in the US, this is what we're, this is what we're doing, right? Um, and certainly we see the criminalization of sex work, of substance use in our community because of transphobia and a lack of access to traditional employment. And there's certainly just a long, long history of a lack of trans competency in mental health, in domestic violence services, in, um, in medical services. And so we see people who are trans being put in solitary holds across all kinds of detention, psychiatric and, and carceral detention systems. They're all carceral, but um, so, and people being put in solitary for, for their own like quote protection just because they're trans. So I think it's really important that people know some of the, some of the trans specific harms that, that happen to people. And that what we really need is like trust that that when we're calling for help, that the help that we get isn't gonna make our crises worse. Like all of this makes our crises worse, actually. Um, we need to recognize that the crises we're experiencing are racism and capitalism and colonialism. And we need to realize that economic redistribution will actually prevent so many crises. Um, that one therapy appointment isn't gonna help you get the, the financial stability that you need. and. And we need to really think about how we can fund and proliferate peer support systems of care and, and really 
keep funding and exploring these alternatives outside of of state systems and behavioral health interventions. So for me, a huge part of the my work is like really helping make folks aware that forced medicalization doesn't actually keep people safe or save save people as as the suicide prevention language would have us otherwise think. Thank you so much, Yana, for really contextualizing so much of that. I think that is super important to um I think really acknowledge the ways that existing inside of different kind of like facets of oppression can really um, shape like a perspective and kind of like access to information um, around just like what you know is possible. And I think that even inside of like some of the access to support that um, people who do experience like multiple um, like kind of like bonds of oppression, um, the access to support that that is kind of had is really like programmatic and very like standardized in a sense. Um, and I think that because of that, some of to what Yana was saying, we don't really get the opportunity to get to kind of like the root of the issue um, that the, the person is actually experiencing. And so like when we do like peer support work and like our like first goal is to center the caller and let them be like the leader and to tell us like what they need and then like make a plan with them or support them, right? And making a plan to like get what it is that they need so that the needs are met. Um, and not just so that they feel better still with these unmet needs. <laughs> a part of that is like really like all oh, allowing people to access their own power. Um through, through some of the agency and like really embodying like what does it mean to to experience consent um, as well as like what does it mean to offer that to someone um, what also does it mean to like exist in in a caring way um, with someone that like maybe you don't even know personally right I think that is a lot of also what what our work um, kind of like turns to is not just like kind of like caring only for like people that we know, but I think inside of the like anonymity of it, um, we offer like really like harm reductive strategies. Um, so that is not really like, I think kind of like specific to certain experiences, but can really approach it and like a let's work backwards from where you're at. Like let's meet you and kind of like ground together. Um, so that is also like, we're not adding to the harm that people are experiencing. Like, it's kind of, we take that analysis and it's like, how can we lessen, like, what's going on? Um, and, like, it's just kind of, like, you know, really, really being, like, inside of it with the person um, in a way that is, of course, boundaried, um, but in a way that, like, you know, really creates more space and more safety so that, like, we can navigate with, with more clarity as, like, people who are, like, receiving this type of support. Um, and I think that that's so important. The um, experience of care as it is now in the, the, the modern psychiatry paradigm, it's always um, uh, this ignoring of the suppression and in fact, like to the point of like, let's just get back to you being okay with this oppression. It's uh, sometimes uh, impossible to wrap my head around how we've decided that this is what works when it's absolutely not what works. It's like Yana was saying, it actually causes this enormous amount of harm and increases so much um, pain and suffering among, you know, all people. I really agree with that. Thank you for bringing that into the space. Well, thank you. Gosh, you know, the work you guys are doing, like I said, is that sort of dom that, that stopping that domino from falling that, that can end in, in a trans person ending their life because of this non-consensual and non-caring, essentially non-caring and non-empathetic care system. Yeah, I think I was going to also add that I think that a lot of what you're naming is why it's important to also see this work as justice work. I think just like holding holding awareness of like offering support to someone of like how this person may experience like the involvement of systems. Um, and this is like coming from the perspective of someone who offers the support. And it's kind of like, you know, how are we honoring the person that we're, we're supporting uh, with the offerings that we make? Um, and I think that a lot of that, um, like what you were saying, as far as just like people really being in positions to experience more harm just because of that, like lack of awareness of like, what does it mean to involve like this entity? 
Um, and I think that's why a lot of the work that Yana is doing is so important to really create awareness around like what it means to involve these entities. All right, so um, I guess the last question, if you're just to summarize the driving point of your work and its importance, what would you want listeners to know about providing community support on your hotline? On an individual like basis, like I think that um, there is a focus definitely in the work that we do on the on the trans community because those are the people who we support. And it's like when we're supporting people, um, we access like their individual lives um, and like those individual needs. And we create those individual plans with them. Um, and so I think that that it's like the connection part that comes with caring for another person is like in this moment, can we like, you know, exist inside of this this time and this space with another person um, to, to like amplify the, their access to like resources. Um, I think that's really a lot of like what we do. I think it can be like iterated differently inside of like maybe kind of like, I think the work that Jan is doing where it's like, you know, how can we exist with these people, right? To amplify like, like their access um, to, to like awareness, right? Like how many people are aware of this thing? And it's really like, you know, how do we access our own power and like add it to somebody else's? Um, and that's really the work that we're doing. So yeah, thank you for that, that opportunity. Thank you both so much for being here with me today. I think this was a, a great um, conversation and I think our listeners are gonna learn a whole lot. And um, good luck with this work and um, and you get all the support that you need. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.